Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. This is here in number 20 of our 179 period of sessions that is virtual. Title Criminalization of Human Rights Defenders in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in Venezuela. This is a hearing requested by a group of civil society organizations from Venezuela, among them Promea, Civiles, Conviti, and CEPAS. When you take the floor, please introduce yourselves. Today with me are my colleagues, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena, that is a country reporter for Venezuela. Also, Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay, that is reporter for Afrodescendant Persons and Against Racial Discrimination. Also, Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, who is a reporter for Persons Deprived of Their Freedom. Also, Today with us are the Acting Executive Secretary, Maria Claudia Pulida, and the Special Rapporteur for uh, Freedom of Expression, Pedro Baca. My name is Cheryl Hernandez. I'm the Rapporteur for Human Rights Defenders and Justice Operators, and, and acting as Rapporteur, I will be presiding over today's hearing. You know the methodology. The civil society organizations will have uh, 20 minutes for their presentation. Then the representatives of the National Assembly of Venezuela before the OAS will have another 20 minutes. And after that, we will have the comments of the Inter-American Commission for 20 minutes. And then we will divide the remaining time between the two parties in order to then have some uh, closing remarks by the commission. For those who are following us on social media or over Zoom, we would like to tell you that we have a simultaneous interpretation, English into Spanish and Spanish into English. You can activate the interpretation on the toolbar with the glove that you see at the bottom, bottom of the screen. Please, while this hearing is being conducted, everybody should have their cameras on, but please only uh, unmute yourselves when you are taking the floor. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations for 20 minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. And commissioner uh, and other commissioners and the rapporteur and all those present colleagues, the ambassador before the OAS. My name is Feliceno Reina. I'm the representative of Civiles and Acción Solidaria. The current humanitarian situation of Venezuela is affecting the Venezuelan populations, and we see that there are bigger impacts because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As uh, it is shown by the documentation that we have, that is UM Venezuela, uh, is a document prepared by several civil society organizations and human rights organizations that are collecting information regarding the impacts on the right to health, to food, education, and access to water, and regarding the living conditions of uh, Venezuelans, at least 19 million people out of a population of 28 million people are in a situation of uh, poverty. So we see an increase of 600,000 people that are now in a situation of poverty. 13 uh, million people are also in a situation of food insecurity. So therefore, we are seeing an increase of 40 percent. And this add, uh, adds up to the 2 million people that uh, were identified in 2019. And that the, most of the figures are before the coronavirus. The Venezuelan society is seeing a dismantle of the institutions or the democratic institutions, communities and civil society organizations are claiming for rights. And we need to overcome the political conflict in order to have changes center on the population because they are being threatened. 
among the patterns that affect the guarantees of human rights. We would like to mention the criminalization of human rights defenders, especially because they are accused uh, without any legal basis of hate speech and several crimes because they defend human rights. There is a systematic harassment against journalists, community leaders, students, human rights defenders, because they protest or they report on the situation of people. And we see also arbitrary detentions that also create uh, problems uh, for the human rights missions uh, led by NGOs. These patterns are affecting the civil society of Venezuela. We have the cases of uh, Acción Solidaria, Prepara Familia, and Convite. We know that they are suffering a very specific situations. Five of their members have been detained. They do not enjoy uh, full freedom, even though they have been incarcerated. We also would like to mention the law of international cooperation, which was presented in 2005 and then in 2010. In 2006, the Commission said and showed its concern regarding some of the clauses of the law that could create barriers to the access of information and independence and the functioning of NGOs in the country. At that time, the text of the Commission also said that the commission observes that the language of several of the clauses of the bill and the marching of power that it gives to the government makes the, uh, or opens the possibility that the rules or these regulations are interpreted in a wrong way that could affect seriously the functioning if NGOs in the country. I would like to say that this law that goes against international standards of freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, would undermine the rights of the population to protect their rights, and that would lead to a loss and a discriminatory loss of their resources that are already insufficient in order to uh, respond to the massive humanitarian crisis and the damages that the population of Venezuela is suffering. Now they are even more, most exposed because of the pandemic. I would like to give my, the floor to my colleague, Marino Alvarado. Commissioners, the de facto government of Nicolás Maduro, Maduro thinks that Venezuela is a big military station the context of health emergency because of the pandemic and the lockdown have led to several forms of abuse against persons. My colleague Feliciano Reina has mentioned some of them. The lockdown is carried out in a discretionary manner without, and is affecting those sectors that are most vulnerable. The rights cannot be suspended even in the middle of the emergency for the COVID-19 pandemic. The lack of criteria to guarantee rights has also led to the control over the population and the territory. And this has led to several violations of human rights. So the state has made security a priority over health and other rights. These abuses have affected health professionals, social communicators, political activists, human rights defenders, and persons who have uh, express their voices demanding rights. Even people from the poorest areas of the country have uh, gone to the streets to demand rights. The audio is breaking all the time. Be 
Uh, people have been detained for not complying with lockdown. Uh, there are also obligations of forced labor for not complying with the lockdown. Social media is being used under the control of the state in order to exert control over political actors. During the first months of the emergency state of, in Venezuela, that is between March and December 2020, according to the data collected by Laboratorio de Paz and Promea, 258 persons were detained. This does not include the temporary detentions of several persons because they were not wearing a mask or they were not following the health measures. Out of those 250 persons that were arbitrarily detained, 59 are women. That is 22.8% of the total number. In April, the second month of the lockdown was the month the saw an increase in the number of arbitrary detentions. 35% of those arbitrary detentions occur in that month. We'd like to say that the arbitrary detentions against human rights defenders, we know that those most affected are those human rights defenders that defend the right to work. Non-union leaders were detained. These detentions are against the recommendations made by the Inter-American Commission, and also they are against the uh, recommendations made by the ILO in its Convention 169. The ILO show its concern for the persecution of union leaders and work leaders. We have also other arbitrary detentions. Five activists from the civil society organizations, Representative Gilberto Soto, and also water right defender Alvaro Perez was also detained yesterday. Because of the pandemic, there is a uh, an there is a policy of persecution, especially uh, against those that oppose the government. They try to criminalize and to inform about those persons that present demands and protests that criticize Maduro's government. We would like to say that the persecution for political uh, goals is systematic. And this has been said by the commission and also by the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations, Michelle Bachelet. The International Mission, the audio is uh, cutting all the time, it's breaking. So we see that there is, this is, shows the seriousness of the situation of the state of Venezuela. We are trying to make all the efforts to hold those responsible accountable. From March to December 2020, unfortunately, six persons were murdered during the protests uh, for that were requesting or demanding a better situation and access to water uh, services. So now I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Laura Aunza, that is from the organization Access to Justice. Good afternoon, and thank you for giving me the floor. So I will start. Okay, as a matter of fact, the idea today is to denounce, in this instance, the model that is trying to be implemented from the official, from the officialist assembly, even if it was rejected by referendum by most of the population in 2017, 2007, when 
um, a former President Chavez proposed this in several national laws. This is included, but it hasn't been fully implemented. However, the current National Assembly, which is completely from the ruling party, approved a plan with 35 uh, laws that need to be passed this year. We do not know most of these laws. They haven't been analyzed with the population, among which uh, they include the um, international cooperation law that our colleague Feliciano already mentioned. And it also includes some laws related to the state itself. We are very much concerned about it. The communal state is a kind of state that puts an end not only to the organized civil society, which is the topic of today's hearing, but with citizens themselves, with the civil society. And they transform a group of citizens in an agency that will be part of the state, but as a matter of fact, are also part of a community. Let me explain what I mean by this. First of all, this law, one of these laws has been passed on the first debate. It is the communal cities law. Each communal city has a foundation charter, like a social pact, with public powers. These instances work as if it were the federal government. It is a replication with the same amount of powers and branches. It is citizens organized in communities who are not organized by direct vote or secret vote, but which have power on the budget and they can even receive municipal powers or even by the national state. These citizens are subject to the executive and in particular to the national executive because their acknowledgement depends on it. It is also said that in their bylaws, they should be there for socialism or for the construction of socialism when as a matter of fact, what they are doing is fostering one single and compulsory political ideology. And they say that the rest of their powers or the branches of the state need to be at the service of popular power. And they need to rule, but obeying the popular power when we know that the popular power is subjected to the executive branch as well. This is very serious because the citizens will provide services to themselves, but they can also apply, they can be punished or reviewed by the national state, by the executive power, and therefore we will see that there will be social control that will be even stronger. Justice will be the peace justice, but it belongs to the national one. And there will be instances created in the communities to deal with victims, to deal with women as victims of violence. But evidently, this will make important principles such as the freedom of persons, the democratic sovereignty, the separation of powers of the state disappear because there is no real way within the state, the national state and the executive power to know what happens within those instances. And the national executive branch and the state will not give any explanations to the state or to the citizens. So this will make the humanitarian uh, emergency even worse. The control of the political uh, power that Maduro's administration has and the little bit that remains of civil society will disappear and organized society will disappear as well. Thank you. My name is Beatriz Borges from Centro Justicia y Paz. The role of organizations of the civil society from Venezuela has been essential in the domain of international protection agencies for human rights in terms of complaints and advocacy of the violations to human rights that take place in Venezuela. The organizations of the civil society have sent information about the crisis of human rights that we have in our current crisis to these agencies, such as the specific procedures of the UN, the Office of the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights, and the interim International Mission for the Rights of Venezuela and the Commission itself. In this work, in this international work of the civil society that tries to create these spheres for uh, the benefit of the Venezuelan society, mainly taking into account the deterioration of the justice system in Venezuela that makes, that makes it impossible for victims to find reparation, we find 
a country that is restrictive in terms of the rights with persecutions, with repression, with stigmatization campaigns and retaliation against what the civil society wants, but it, we are just making our work. It is important to find out that the restriction in terms of human rights applies to several actors of the civil area and dissidents who have been considered dissidents to the state policy and to the ones that are in power nowadays. We've monitored and registered in the first two months of 2021, 127 facts that represent criminalization and persecution, including threats, stigmatization, censorship, arbitrary deten detentions, cruel treatment against political leaders or workers of the legisl legislation, organizations of the civil society, among other actors and some cases that were mentioned by my previous, my colleagues who have previously taken the floor and that we've sent to the commission. The rights belonging to the civic space, such as association, expression and participation are systematically undermined in Venezuela, also restricting the sphere for the protection of human rights of all Venezuelan people. Finally, and as it was also mentioned by my colleagues, we would like to repeat that in this restrictive environment of uh, persecution, the UN has identified in its report the crimes of Venezuelan authorities, whose crimes committed against the societies, the organizations of the civil society are framed within the crimes of against humanity as part of a systematized series of attacks. Therefore, we need to increase the efforts of protection to, uh, to the rights violated in Venezuela. Therefore, we would like to ask the Commission first to reject and to try to put an end to the criminalization and persecution patterns in Venezuela that are conducted against the civil society in Venezuela and the rest of the civic groups in our country by the authorities controlling the public spheres, that it will call upon the national authorities to restitute the warranties and the rights that enable the right and democratic area so that the civil society can develop. Third, that the national authorities provide the secure conditions so that the civil society within the health uh, pandemic that we have will enable access to programs. And finally, number four, that it will call upon the authorities and that it will demand the legislatory authorities not to foster any other laws that try to create a state-based society undermining the principle of uh, freedom. I will keep the extra minutes for uh, the second intervention. Thank you. I thank the organizations of the civil society. Now I will give the floor for 20 minutes to the permanent mission designed by the assembly um, on the OAS. Thank you very much, commissioners. I thank the rest of the commissioners who are present here, uh, Madam Margaret McCauley, Estuardo Rolón, and Esmeralda Rosemena, and the rapporteur for Venezuela. I also thank uh, my colleagues, Feliciano Reina, Alvarado, Laura Alonso. Um, as I've done in other occasions, where I had to represent the state, the Venezuelan state, I would like to remind you of the atypical nature of these hearings in terms of Venezuela, or as far as Venezuela goes. When we have these kind of meetings, like face-to-face -face meetings, there used to be a table uh, at one corner and then another table with the representation of the state. Now, that separation, that is to say, having the representatives uh, facing, that is to say, Venezuelans facing the OAS and the defenders of human rights, that doesn't happen in the current Venezuelan reality. Now we are sitting side by side by the HR defendants. We support them and we work in joint 
cooperation with them. The time will come when we will have to move on to not only defending the state, but also ensuring that, I ensure you that our dream is that there will be no representative of the Venezuelan state that will try to undermine or to reduce any arguments presented by organizations that aim at keeping human rights, which is a common, a common goal of everyone, who are here, of all of us. The vulnerability of the human rights defenders is one of the topics, one of the most important topics that we will address. We've learned throughout the year the mission that is working on this topic and that is here with us today as well. Rafael Castillo and Laura Cantilla. They are in constant touch with the organizations of human rights and with the commissioner for human rights, all of whom are working from Caracas. This situation of vulnerability is evidently bringing a lot of concern to us. They are talking about human rights defenders and workers who devote, with all their sacrifice, they devote their lives to defending the dispossessed trying to bring humanitarian aid to those who are currently lacking the protections of the state and they are also lacking an economic and social system that will enable Venezuelans to earn, uh, to make a living and to have access to education, to public services and to food. Therefore, the situation that we are currently experiencing here in the OAS is the support to the management of Venezuela and to human rights defenders there. So when you come here, and I repeat this, I repeat this for the commissioners, you will not get any denial on my part of your arguments, but actually a big, big support. I'm not talking about defending or hiding or, or undermining any complaints that we know are true. Therefore, consequently, what can be expected out of the Venezuelan mission to the OAS is a support, the support to what the claimants are saying. This is the reason of the political fight that we are uh, waging in, Venez in Venezuela to restitute respect for human rights and to restitute the enforcement of the constitution. There are legislative elements that are very important. The law against hatred has become a tool that is an open door to arbitrary behaviors. Those are criminal types that are open. They are managed at complete uh, discretionality by the agencies of the state. And that aim at trying to suppress the action of the organizations that work with human rights organizations that try to help or to provide humanitarian aid, they laws they are laws with ambiguous clauses, and that they are incompatible with the main principles of criminal law and law in general. That kind of laws are bringing a lot of concern to us. We are also very much concerned about legislation that tries to link the human rights organizations with terrorism, with organized crime, with money laundering. All of that are pretexts used by a dictatorship in order to persecute people who are seen as a threat, a threat against the regime. So, I mean, their visible face to the international agencies uh, is, I mean, they want to remove the legal tools and administrative tools that they have, and they are always going to try and bring the rejection of the interim government in this case. In our opinion, the situation that Venezuela is experiencing from the point of view of human rights is very similar to what happens in different dictatorship times in Venezuela. 
that unfortunately, I mean, this is not new for us, unfortunately, there are no country, no country that respects human rights 100%, but still in, there is a very big difference between that and a systematic violation of human rights. And our stance there is very clear. We want, uh, we want this stance to be very clear in the face of all the commissioners. Just to wrap up, I would like to make reference to the problem of the communal um, state that was mentioned before. There is an open violation to the constitution when trying to replace the organization of the state that is included in 1989 um, text by a proposal that had been rejected by a referendum when trying to reform the constitution back then, and then the Venezuelan people rejected. So this goes back to the analysis. I mean, we're talking about more than 30 laws that are trying to be approved or passed with electoral fraud. I mean, an, an assembly whose legitimacy has not been accepted by the American states, even before their election, by rejecting the way in which the election was held, in which everything took place, as well as the result that show that by no means shows the popular will. That legislation is not legitimate because of the reasons that I've just mentioned. And it is also not legitimate in the sense that what they are, it's trying to implement in Venezuela has nothing to do with the democratic state, has nothing to do with the rule of law and against all the principles for organization of the state that are included in the Venezuelan constitution. In the face of that, the organizations defending human rights will have full support of our administration and of our mission, of the permanent mission to the OES. As I have done in other occasions, and I, let me ask the commissioners to accept to continue with this policy, I prefer to leave the rest of the time for those who are here to present complaints, to file complaints here. I think that they have information, well, some information that we do have, but in some cases it's new information. So I think it is a, um, very relevant indeed to leave as much time as possible for them so that they can explain or and they can show what they consider to be systematic violations of human rights in Venezuela. So if the commissioners have any uh, any disagreement on this, please do, do let me know. But then there are 12 minutes for the disposal of the organizations of the civil society from Venezuela to continue or to expand on any complaints that they have. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we will now continue with this section of comments uh, by the commissioners, executive secretary, and by the special rapporteur. I will give the floor first to the country rapporteur, Esmeralda Arosemena. Thank you, my um, president. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to express first uh, I would like to acknowledge first the strength of civil society organizations. This includes uh, all these organizations, civiles, eh, compite, sepas. I don't have uh, special remarks that I would like to say to recognize or to acknowledge I don't have enough words to acknowledge your strength, your solidarity with uh, your the citizens of your country. Because uh, there is not only a political crisis, but also a humanitarian crisis. Saying that 19 million people are in poverty, multidimensional poverty, is a strong and difficult burden. You are seeking for an answer 
for a way out. How you can contribute so that Venezuela recovers its greatness, its wealth. How can we do this? Facing this complex and difficult situation, the Inter-American Commission and I, as country reporter, have been permanently monitoring the situation. We thank you for this opportunity so you could share with us all the information. We have our friend, Gustavo, that is the ambassador uh, to the OAS. I know about your commitment, that your efforts because the continent needs this vision so that we are committed to help Venezuela to search and to find a way out. Because we know that the, situ the current situation implies the destruction of the rule of law, the dismantling of democratic institutions and defining rights under these conditions, under these circumstances. It's a work that can only be done by great spirits, by people that are very strong, that are very strong human beings. Today, after some of the information presented by the organizations of civil society, I know that there is no judicial independence. And asking questions about uh, criminal types is useless because I know that they have a criminal system that should uh, I know that there must be a legal system in Venezuela, a criminal legal system in Venezuela, but when the regulations are not there, when there are no rules and when there are no principles. So there are no principles, uh, not, there are there, no principles uh, governing the criminal uh, law system of the rest of the world. So uh, like, I understand that the actions that you are proposing are not valid because the criminal types you're talking about are no longer valid there. I know that you have conducted activities to request a response by the judiciary because we have void norms and laws and they are using these norms in order to criminalize, to criminalize a group of human rights defenders in the country. So, I would like to know what is this, what the situation of the criminal law system in Venezuela is. How the criminal law system of Venezuela is responding to the demands of people. I know that even the constitution has been harmed, has been damaged, but those of us who have been judges feel that judges are also responsible and that they should also respond to their duty to provide protection. And that is based in law. And we know that there is a lot that are there to defend persons. 
So I am concerned regarding the position of the judicial power. And with regard to the set of norms, for example, that of uh, communal or community cities, the ambassador has already talked about uh, the implications of these uh, communal cities on the and the effects on the constitution. I would like to know what the legislative processes will be if we have a parliament. I would like to know if you think that the legislative power of Venezuela could face these constitutional issues because these are bills that go are against the constitution of Venezuela. So I know that this is complex, difficult, dark. This is a very dark situation of the justice system in Venezuela. How can we contribute? The commission will be, will continue to monitor the situation in Venezuela and will be supporting the positions of other international organizations that are already pronounced in this matter. But I would like to know your perspective or your uh, views about the bodies of the state, how are they responding to the constitution and to the international treaties that are still in force in Venezuela? That's my question, Commissioner Joel. I'm sorry, but for me, Venezuela is something that affects us all. We need to find a way out and to support uh, them. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to ask Commissioner Macaulay if she would like to take the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. And um, my dear sister Esmeralda, I assure you I will not be as long as Esmeralda. Um, so she's country rapporteur. Um, I, I am very concerned um, about Venezuela. And every time we have a hearing about it, I feel very, very sad because that was the country which one hoped and showed such promise. Um, rich country. And now to hear us, as my sister, as, as you said, 90 million people out of 28 million live in poverty and extreme poverty. And lots of them have no portable water. This is terrible. This is this that alone is is to use an exaggeration a crime against humanity. And one wonders what is the purpose of it? Is the purpose is it the purpose to destroy the will of the people by making the largest number of the population so poor? that they can only concentrate on the seriousness of scraping a survival from day to day so that the powers that be can exercise authoritarian power as much as they like. Is that the purpose? Because how can anybody destroy a country in this way? And as, as, as Mirana asked, my question really is, how do you continue to be so courageous and committed? What do you feel within yourselves, in your heart, can happen in the next few years? Because this cannot go on much longer for the, for the peoples of Venezuela. I would like to know how you are so courageous and determined and committed and continue to be. How do you feel deep in your heart and soul? 
because we're all, I know Esmeralda and I, we go to El Misa together. We go to mass together when we travel. So we pray. Is this what you do? Because, you know, I, sometimes you one wishes that one is a witch, that you wave a wand and you can do things. But unfortunately, we do not have that ability. So please tell me, how do you feel? Do you think that the work the commission is doing with your help will succeed? We know time is not our own. We know nobody can remain forever in this world and things must change. But for how long can you wait? And for how long can the people of Venezuela wait? So my friends, my question is about your feeling. I will pray and continue praying. Thank you. Gracias, Commissioner. Le pregunto Thank Commissioner you, Commissioner Margaret. I would like to ask Commissioner Rallon if he would like to take the floor. Thank you, President. I would like to greet my colleagues and I would like to especially greet the representatives of the different civil society organizations that are here today. In spite of a scenario or a dramatic scenario, they are doing a heroic task for the defense of human rights in Venezuela. I also would like to greet the representative of the permanent mission uh, Gustavo that is today with us in this hearing. I would like to say that in the commission, before the complex situation of Venezuela has made several pronouncements and has pointed out to the escalation of situations of stigmatization against human rights defenders, against journalists, on February the 5th of 2021, the Commission, together with the Special Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression, issued a press release which talked about the concern of the Commission for the closure of all the democratic institutions or spaces and for the use of stigmatizing statements that define journalists as enemies of Venezuela. And uh, they, they were threatened that they shouldn't, and they were warned against continuing making pronouncements against the situation of Venezuela. We know that the dramatic situation is still there. We will continue working, reporting the violations. We will be granting precautionary measures. We will make pronouncements in order to make that situation visible. That is the support that we can provide. And today, I wrote down what Laura Sosa said regarding the community cities. Basically, as she described it, there are some organizations that belong to the executive power and their names are confusing because they look like civil society organizations, but they are not. They are a branch that executes the policies of the executive power. And they destroy the legitimate work of civil society. And they uh, prevent you from requesting accountability because instances are created outside the principle of illegality where there is no separation of powers. 
as Ambassador Tarre was saying, there was a referendum in which uh, the Venezuelan people say no to this regime. Uh, they are having 30 laws in order to continue in power. The situation described today uh, has already been communicated to the commission, but if you have detailed information or supplementary information, I would like uh, for the commission to receive it because we are seeing a, great, a greater harm against civil society. And with information and with the instruments that are at our disposal, we will make pronouncements and take measures in order to make this policy of the executive power visible because we know that the policy hinders the work of human rights defenders in Venezuela. The issue of Venezuela is part of our chapter five of our annual report. All my colleagues are sensitive regarding the situation. This is a priority for the commission. And we are here to for you. We are we are at your disposal. We want to support you, and we want to support the work you do as human rights defenders. Thank you, President. Thank you. We are just running out of time or the time assigned to the commission, but I think the special rapporteur would like to take the floor. So you have some minutes. Thank you, Mr. President, and greetings to those who called for this hearing and for everyone who is participating here. I would like to share a reflection with you. The pandemic has set challenges to all the rules of law, but now the big question is what happens when there is no rule of law? I think that in other countries where, of course, there are challenges to democracy, we can see where the judicial branches are the counter, the, the counterbalance for all of this. But here we see that before the pandemic, there was almost full erosion of the rule of law in Venezuela. And following that, there is a pandemic that implies taking arbitrary decisions in this regard. Therefore, from the rapporteurship, we believe it is very important to document the situation. There is a very strong articulation with the organizations there and the mechanisms that are activated from the commission or from the rapporteurship. I would like to ask you whether it is possible to expand on the topics that you told us about. The first one, as far as I understand, those detentions operate on groups of people or people that also have critical thoughts or critical ideology regarding the regime. I believe that, well, I mean, this is something that we would like, if possible, for you to add, uh, to expand. And also the right of freedom of association. Can you, do you think that this can be a deterrence for people to share their knowledge or to disseminate their ideology. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. I don't want to interrupt the dialogue of this hearing. So I will give the floor directly to the organizations. I understand that the permanent um, um, representative of the permanent mission has given the rest of the time for you. So you have the remaining time. And just at the end, I will have keep some space for a few final remarks as rapporteur for defenders. And I will also invite the acting secret secretary in case she wants to add any final comments. Therefore, we will uh, wait for the end, but now you have the floor. All the remaining time is for you. So whoever wants to take the floor, go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Mr. President of the Inter-American Commission. My name is Eduardo Trujillo, and I come to you as a representative of the Center of Human Rights of the Catholic University, Andres Bello. Among the many things that you talked about, that all commissioners have mentioned, uh, and as well as the special rapporteur has mentioned, okay, we will try to expand little by little. First of all, I would like to show or to tell you, given the fact that the title of this hearing is the situation of human rights defenders within the framework of the pandemic of COVID-19, that human rights defenders in Venezuela have received attacks on two sides. On the one hand, on the de facto way that was explained by Andrea Santa Cruz with special interventions, and by a more straightforward side. Since 2005 in Venezuela, there is a danger of the implementation of an international cooperation law that restricts in one way or another the activity of the civil society organizations in Venezuela that are independent. The possibility of uh, having an international cooperation law implemented in our country that was approved on the first debate in 2006 and then in 2010 it was resumed with the possibility of analyzing this law later on in 2012 and in 2015 again specifically in November 2015 showed that there were dangers related to uh, the implementation of this law on international cooperation. This happened again in the international agenda now in 2021. It's no secret for the Inter-American Commission that based on the information given by the National Assembly in December of 2020, one of the projects uh, one of the priority projects of its agenda was the approval of, a, of an international cooperation law within the framework of the possible approval of such a law in Venezuela that would become, that would have an effect on the civil society organizations affecting people with the possibility to receive international cooperation and to conduct international cooperation projects independently. The current regulation in Venezuela in this regard dates back to 1958. Since 2006, we had not had, according to the parliament, we had not had the need to adapt this regulation. We consider that this possible reform to this law is a whim is whimsical because of the organizations in order to try and restrict the actions of the organizations in Venezuela that are seen as a political enemy by the state and not as organizations that help to keep democratic values, which at the end of the day is what they do, what human rights organizations do. So in this draft law, they also talk about a compulsory registry, a record, that would have a negative impact on the freedom of association, as the special rapporteur had said before, or the possibility to create a cooperation fund where there are fears or there is a risk that part of what will be received by international cooperation has to be devoted to purposes determined by the state that would completely change the uh, contribution dynamics, not only of the social, uh, the civil society, but also the humanitarian sphere that has also received attacks during 2020. Now, moving on to the different interventions of the members of the commission, regarding the question, regarding the question of Commissioner Arosemena about the communal state and about how the Venezuelan state answers or responds to that from the constitutional point of view, to the possible implementation of the communal state in Venezuela. Well, you have the answer yourselves because as a matter of fact, you've made a statement in this regard, the judicial power in Venezuela is not independent 
it is not an independent power. We've mentioned here that this is something that is that is not included in the constitution and the civil society organizations here would like the Inter-American Commission to reinforce the, this topic as well as others, of course, and to act faster on the requests for precautionary measures that they will not only be approved or passed for cases of personal integrity, as is the case of, or the current practice of the commission. Another important point is that the commission might start analyzing cases or sending cases to the Inter-American Court of Non-Human Rights, whether it is using the argument of ratification with retroactive uh, cases or using other treaties that are still under the jurisdiction of the court. Those are tools, those are instruments that the Inter-American Commission might use. Now, mm, on the question posed by Commissioner Macaulay, how we feel, the human rights defenders, how we feel? Well, in 2020, we felt completely attacked, which is the resistance capacity that we have here in Venezuela. Okay, we still have a lot of resistance. This is our land. We believe in these principles, in these values within the framework of the rule of law, of democracy, where equality facing the law will be defended. And we are going to defend that as far as possible. Now, that's our feeling. That's the feeling that the civil society of Venezuela has. Now, uh, let me give the floor to Andres Dacos. I would like to thank all the commissioners and the special rapporteur for your comments and for your questions. In particular, I would like to address the questions posed by Commissioner Arosemena regarding the situation of the jurisdictional entities, that is to say, facing the laws that were presented already. I think that an example that might be very useful right now is what the Supreme Court of Justice has done against the National Assembly in its previous management or administration, where all laws were declared inconstitutional, thus showing a clear pattern in terms of acting against the National Assembly, which in turn was against the government. But connected to the framework of this hearing, which is the pandemic, Let's analyze the decrees with which the state of alarm was included. The first one was on March the 13th, 13, 11 decrees and its prorogations were instituted, even if the constitution says that the decree could have lasted for an extra 30 days which, of course, this, is, this goes against what was included in the Constitution, and they pointed out that it was inconstitutional, giving us the idea as well that we're always living on an economic uh, emergency decree that has been prorogated for 31 times, and all of them declared constitutional by the assembly. So this is just an example of how the, I mean, you know this yourselves because we, you've pointed it out in many reports, how in Venezuela there are no independence of the branches. In our understanding, it is a tool for political persecution and a tool that allows impunity for everyone who shows to be in favor of the interests of those who have the de facto power in Venezuela. Then, something else that I think is important to point out is that what happens when there is no rule of law? Uh, Rapporteur Vaca was mentioning this. Well, in Venezuela, we have a humanitarian emergency that is even deepened by a world pandemic. That scenario shows us that we are at a favorable time to worsen the violations to human rights to deepen the violations and the crimes against humanity that are currently taking place in Venezuela. And that implies a commitment not only by the Venezuelan organizations, but also by the international community to address what is happening in my country right now. We believe 
that in Venezuela, the institutions are broken. That's part of the reason why there is such a complex humanitarian emergency. We have no independent justice. We do not have a democratic government. The institutions are dismantled. There is a destructuring of the social and economic functioning. So you can see that the emergency is very complex. And that this is a scenario that has to be ongoingly pointed out and never forgotten. In addition to this, within this context, the Venezuelan state has decided to take actions that close the civic space in Venezuela. And that's why we see that they are deepening the harassment against the Venezuelan institutions. We've seen raids with no search warrants. We've seen raids or forced entries with search warrants, but are, that are still arbitrary because they do not comply with the formalities that they can to be conducted. They do not even happen within a criminal context that the organization knows about or even the parties know about. Even when they are trying to find information, what they can see is a non-answer. There is a lack of answer in that sense. So what we feel when you asked us how we felt, we feel very much concerned, but very much committed to this struggle because we are committed to the victims and because we are the single voice of the victims, the single space where they can talk. And therefore, that makes us feel strong to continue acting as far as our possibilities go or allow us. Now, in terms of the issue of detentions of, group of groups of people with critical thoughts, the International Independent Mission was making its update, its oral update about the topics they were analyzing. And they said that they were expanding the term internal enemy or domestic enemy. And they were including the organizations of the civil society within that definition. So complementing what Eduardo Trujillo was saying before, the government with a de facto power is not considering the human rights organizations as a political power, but as they are dissidents or as they show aspects with which they don't feel comfortable, which is, I mean, they are only pointing out the, the compliance, that's enough for them to become stigmatized. And that to use radio or TV, in order to attack the human rights defenders and networks. I close my presentation here and I give the floor to Catherine Martinez. Good afternoon. The connectivity is not good. Good afternoon. We are concerned. Human rights defenders are very concerned. We live in Venezuela and we are working with our colleagues because we see the impact of the threats on those most vulnerable, on the most population of the most vulnerable populations. We work with girls, boys, and adolescents, and the caretakers, they receive the impact of all the threats and harassment. Because when there are situations that we cannot solve because we are not able to monitor as we usually do, when there are those barriers and they cannot help, or they cannot receive humanitarian aid, or when the monitoring of human rights cannot be done and we cannot record what is happening to them, that impacts on them. Even though we defenders continue struggling we are committed to this uh, work 
because those boys and girls are the hope for a different Venezuela. Those we are here and we are committed, we are doing everything that's possible every day so that children receive food and they have access to health services and so that the persons that take care of those children also receive a dignified treatment. So we a struggle and we are here for to defend human rights, to defend human dignity. We are committed. And we saw the commitment of women. We see the commitment. They are women victims and they are now activists. They are committed and we see that there are adolescents that are being trained and they become part of the comedy and they help our children that are waiting for a transplant. So we know that and we see some small results and that's why we work to respond to the state. We will continue working and all the threats, the search warrants, won't be able to stop a civil society that is committed, that is ready to continue fighting. So we will give, uh, make the efforts to continue working. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague Darío and Luis Francisco. Good afternoon, commissioners and brothers and sisters from the petitioner organizations. The civil society organizations are at risk. On December the 15th, our uh, office was a uh, search, but we didn't have access to the search warrant. We did not receive any copy or document. We could not even copy the document that they presented. They search our uh, facilities, uh, searching for arms and explosives. And we have an office with medicines and diapers for adults. That is what we do. We try to help all the persons in Venezuela. They review, they search the place, and they confirm that nothing, uh, none of the goods uh, detail on the search warrant was found, but that was not enough. We were taken to uh, facilities, uh, fires. Uh, they took our phones. We were without communication for two hours and a half. We were questioned without our lawyers. The proceeding was full of irregularities in due process in spite of the search warrant. And we are with fear. Uh, because our people are with fear after these measures, because they feel afraid of working uh, for organizations like ours because they don't want to be exposed. But we also see that some suppliers are not uh, providing us with the services because of the fear they don't want to be related to us because our organization is being persecuted by the government. Our situation is very serious. They are attacking humanitarian aid organizations and therefore they are attacking humanitarian aid and they are attacking those persons uh, that are most affected by the humanitarian crisis, especially older persons. So we uh, have fear. We have fear about working in the street and getting the infection of getting COVID-19 and also the fear of being persecuted. That is not easy. And we also suffered a lot of limitations to transport humanitarian aid from one province to the other, to have to deal with uh, all the mechanisms uh, that are there to hurt us and to limit the access to aid and also to make aid a political thing. To us, this is not easy. But as Catherine was saying, we continue working. We are doing what we know how to do because we are committed to people. We are here to defend rights, but in under these circumstances, we want to provide aid and protection for a huge number of people. 
as the special rapporteur say, was saying and the commissioner was saying, we have 19 million uh, people under uh, or in multidimensional poverty, but we have a very difficult context. And that's why we requested the hearing today. I was interviewed and they asked me if I consider myself someone that is being persecuted. I doubt it when answering. But I told my child if nine years old what I do and explain my wife what she should do if I'm detained. I haven't done that in the past. So I understand now that I'm a persecuted person. My son was there when we our place was searched and he's always asking me. And I had to explain him what we are doing, why we are doing this. So he knows that what we are doing, we are doing this for our country. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Don Luis. Thank you, Mr. Luis. I don't know if anybody else would like to take the floor. We have two minutes left. No. So now I would like to give the floor to the acting executive secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I would like to greet everybody. It's a privilege and it's an honor to see you here. Uh, it's good to see that you are healthy and that you are free. The executive secretariat is supporting the commission in its strategy to uh, make the uh, the observation and the monitoring of the situation of human rights in Mesevi uh, stronger. We are trying to uh, strengthen the Mesevi. That is one of the things that we are trying to do. We want to tell you that our ad mechanism is are working, precautionary measures, system of cases and petitions. All the work of monitoring is working. And we are also, uh, we included uh, Venezuela in the chapter 4B of our annual chapter, which will be published on April the 15th before the political bodies of the OAS. And we also have the country report. And we are receiving testimonies from victims uh, in order to identify different patterns of violations of human rights. We're classifying your testimonies because we believe that there is a responsibility in terms of transitional justice. I would like to mention that the country report has three sections. One, that it has to do with democratic institutions. Another, that is about the situation of human rights. And we are giving the voice to the victims of human rights violations. And a third section that is about the situation of Venezuelans in the region, because they are victims of forced disappearance and of a situation of human mobility. So we would like to tell you that the MESEVI and the Executive Secretariat is committed. We are doing all the monitoring work, all the follow-up work, and we would like to honor you because of your resilience and your courage. Thank you, President. I would like to give you back the floor. Thank you, Maria Claudia. I think that the last intervention, that of Luis Francisco Cabezas, summarizes the complaints that you submitted today to us. He's not only a social leader, and a human rights defender, but he's also a father and a Venezuelan, and he wants a better country for his son and for his colleagues and for his friends, for his family, for his society. The search that he suffered shows the lack of a rule of law, where there are actions of the state that are under no control there is no political or judicial control. The only control that exists is that that you are exercising, that is civil society control. You are 
requesting democratic spaces because only in a democracy there are full respect of human rights and democracy, human rights and the human development are part of an equation that is necessary for the development of people and the respect of dignity. Luis Francisco, I would like to acknowledge your work and I would like to uh, show my solidarity for your testimony because it shows the situation many of you are undergoing. I also would like to acknowledge all those who participated in today's hearing all those human rights defenders that are not quitting, that are still working uh, to have a rule of law and a democracy so that their human rights are being respected. The acting executive secretary presented in a summarized way the work that the commission is doing as a whole, not only the MSEVE, but also all the members of the commission are working, my colleagues, the commissioners, Commissioner Rallon, the special rapporteur for freedom of expression, the special rapporteur for economic, social, culture, and environmental rights, and the whole team of the executive secretariat are working in a coordinated way in order to use this toolbox that the commission has to promote the defense of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the Americas, and especially in Venezuela. We are really concerned about the situation of Venezuela. And in spite of all the circumstances, the commission will stay with you because we stay with the 35 states of the OAS. This is not a political question. The commission has a single mandate and, it had, and that mandate is human rights. And the commission understands very well the mandate that the OAS established. I feel privileged to be a member of this commission, a commission that has a very broad perspective away from any political perspective that works in an independent and partial way. The only goal is the protection and promotion of human rights in the region. We believe in the principle of human dignity. And we will want that principle to be a reality in Venezuela for the benefit of all the Venezuelans, those who are in the country, those 5 million who left the country, the 19 million people that are now are in poverty. We are hopeful, but we won't just wait. Our mandate of the commission is to work. Feel free to get to us, to any of us, to my colleagues, the commissioners, to the members of the staff of the secretariat. We have a mandate and we are committed to that mandate. And uh, it could be in these hearings, during this 179 period of sessions, it doesn't matter when or where. The format is not what matters. You should know that our doors are open. Thank you to all those who participated in this hearing. With this final hearing, we are closing the 179 period of sessions. Take care and see you soon. Gracias, gracias, saludos. Muchas gracias, saludos.